parish workhouses have been around for quite a while. They were normally in buildings that already been built on streets that were already there, nothing specifically built for the workhouse themselves. They were normally run by a local contractor. People had a choice of whether they wanted to be in the workhouse or whether they wanted to stay at home. Either way, they would get help. It was kind of an unemployment benefit. In 1832, the then Prime Minister, Lord Grey, set about researching into it and came up with a bill two years later to state that they should abolish the current system and put a whole new one in place. Now, union workhouses came about due to the Poor Law Amendment of 1834. Instead of receiving money directly, anyone who found themselves in this situation would have to go to a workhouse. There, they would get a roof over their heads, food to eat, clothes to wear, and the help that they needed. If there was any medical help, they'd get it there and then, or they could go to work instead. It was their choice. Now, there was a drop in the amount of poor people when the new workhouses came about, mainly because people didn't want to have to go to a workhouse, be cooped up, lose their freedom. They instead went to work. There was great opposition to this scheme and every opportunity they stood up and fought their corner, telling of the terrible conditions and any issues they could find, but to no avail. And the public didn't want to know either. 11 years they continued their campaign. In 1845, all their hard work seemed to be worth it as they came across the worst scandal so far. Andover. Colin McDougall. Now he doesn't sound like a bad man, does he? Mr. and Mrs. McDougall. But apparently he wasn't so nice and his wife wasn't much better. There are lots of rules around running a workhouse and uh, there was even a group of guardians that basically had to help look after it, making sure things were above board and uh, nothing was going wrong. Unfortunately, uh, the Andover Guardians weren't really up to the task. The McDougals were as strict as they come. They rationed food to a bare minimum, making sure they were all well looked after first, like skimming the milk to make butter for themselves and taking the full milk for themselves before watering it down for all the inmates. I read somewhere that they watered it down two parts of water to one part milk. You. And when other workhouses were getting extra food for special occasions, such as the Queen's coronation, there's Queen Victoria again, or Christmas, the Andover inmates saw none of it. If you were an able-bodied inmate, you would have to work. And um, in Andover, it was bone crushing to make fertilizer. Now, this was definitely a big start to the scandal. The rumor mill started. In 1845, that men were so hungry they were eating off the bones they were supposed to be crushing. Tiny scraps of flesh still present and the marrow inside, anything they could scrape off. This even started to cause fights for the best bones. Currently still a rumour, Hugh Mundy, one of the Guardians, was concerned enough to bring it up with Ralph Etwell. Now he was a prominent Andover MP, who also happened to be against the Poor Law Commission. The inmates of Andover were in the habit of quarrelling with each other about the bones, of extracting the marrow and of gnawing the meat. Ralph took it further. Now the Home Secretary was a bit shocked but didn't really believe it, but he did order an investigation. Henry Parker was dispatched. He was Assistant Poor Law Commissioner for Andover. It was true! And there was a lot of press attention, as you can imagine. The Poor Law Commission was under attack from the public, from the press and from the government. By September, McDougall had resigned as master. And by the November, bone crushing had been forbidden. It was found that McDougalls were unfit for the post. Inmates were given less than their rations due. And the Guardians were neglectful and had failed to actually visit to check on the inmates. I read somewhere that um, they hadn't visited since 1840. Master Colin McDougall was also known to be quite a drunk. He used to mistreat his wife, although by all accounts, she gave as good as she got. He also seduced some of the younger inmates and so did his son, who was schoolmaster at the time. The dead had it no better. If a baby died, they were marked as stillborn to save the cost of baptism. A baby was buried with an old man to save on coffin costs. Witnesses revealed the horror of the bone crushing. Not only was this ridiculously hard work, 28 pounds of rammer to crush the bones in a bone tub. The smell was awful and even boys as young as eight were being made to do it and only able to if working in pairs, otherwise they couldn't lift the hammer. There was so much that it filled two volumes in 1846 when it was all written down. Now this was the final straw and less than a year later the Poor Law Commission was abolished and the new Poor Law Board was set up. 
which increased the supervision of the law because they were directly accountable to Parliament. Now, obviously, Andover isn't the only scandal that happened throughout the workhouses, but as it was my local one, I kind of wanted to tell the story. And if it wasn't for this all coming up from the Andover workhouse, uh, a lot of things may have gone unchecked at other workhouses for a lot longer. Now, the Andover workhouse was built in 1836 and is still quite an imposing building. In the past, it's been used from Cricklade College and now it is very luxurious flats and apartments. Now, finally, the Oliver Twist, Charles Dickens rumour. Rumour did have it that Charles Dickens actually visited the workhouse and this is where he got his idea for Oliver Twist. Unfortunately not. Oliver Twist was written before the workhouse scandal at Andover. And in fact, um, Oliver may have had it hard, but I'm not convinced he even had it as hard as some of the young lads that were in Andover Workhouse. 